Two of the biggest myths out there when it comes to mixing are that you need expensive, accurate monitors and an expensive, accurate room. Now, like all the other myths I'm gonna talk about, I learned this the hard way through actual real world experience. So let's start with the monitors. You don't need really fancy, expensive, super accurate monitors. What you need is monitors that you know really well. I've worked in the multi-million dollar studios. They've got the big fancy mains, they've got expensive midfield and near field monitors, you know, the barefoots, the Genelix, all that stuff. And when I'm listening on those, I feel completely lost. Like I'm totally a fish out of water. I can't make any decisions. That's because I don't know what music is supposed to sound like on those speakers. Imagine you're looking at a photograph and the colors have all been doctored. They've all been tinted and changed, but you wouldn't know that until you saw the original beside it. And that's the experience that a lot of people are having when they're mixing in their studios and then they finally take it out into the real world and it sounds completely different and they hear all the flaws. So for me, if I'm working at another studio, I have to listen on NS10s in order to make any decisions. I would not dare to track or mix without them. Now, is that because there's something special about the NS10s? Well, sort of, but that's not really the point. The reason why is because I've been working on them for over 10 years. I know what a kick drum and what a guitar sound or a vocal is supposed to sound like on NS10s. And that's the point. I'm way less concerned with what monitors you're using than that you just know them really well. And the funny thing is that a lot of people, you know, they spend years and years and years listening to their favorite records in their car or on their favorite headphones or pair of ear pods or stereo at home. And then they go into the studio with these completely different speakers and it doesn't translate. And the only solution to this is to log more hours listening to music and records that you really know and love on your studio monitors. It's gotta become instinctual and subconscious that you just automatically know what a finished record should sound like on your speakers. When it comes to choosing your monitors, the more extended the range is, meaning the more low frequency and high frequency content they put out, the harder they are to mix on. And that's because those really big, fat, low frequency subs and those silky, airy highs, they're very deceptive. They fool you into thinking that your mix has enough low end or has enough presence. But those extreme ends of the frequency range are the parts that do not translate well or translate predictably outside of the studio. So smaller speakers like NS10s or the CLA10s or mix cubes, they pretty much limit your frequency range. They don't put out a ton of sub frequencies. They don't put up a really extended high end. And so they force you to focus on what really matters, which is the mid range. And that's the stuff that's gonna translate and sound powerful everywhere. This idea of knowing your speakers applies to your room as well. And that's the next big myth that you need a really great accurate room in order to mix. No, you need a decent room that you know really well. So I've had really well treated rooms. I've worked in those big studios. And the weird thing I found is that the less ideal my room was, the better my mixes sounded. Now, you do need some basic treatment. I mean, if you're just in a room with bare walls all around you, it's gonna be really hard to mix. The sound's gonna be bouncing around everywhere and it'll be a bit of a nightmare. But you don't need to go as crazy as you might think. So if you can get some two foot by four foot acoustic panels like these ones, hang them up on your walls with about a foot space in between them, you'll be fine. I mean, in my room here, I, I haven't even put treatment up on the back wall at all and there hasn't been any problem with that. Now you also wanna look out for hard surfaces on your floor and ceiling. If you've got both of those, you might have some sound bouncing in between them, that's not good. So if you've got two hard surfaces, put a rug down or hang a panel above you as a type of ceiling cloud. Now if you wanna get bonus points, you can straddle the corner with one of these panels like I have here. That's gonna help trap more bass frequencies. But again, back to your monitor choice, if you're mixing on small monitors, like I am here, they're not putting out much sub low end anyways. And so that becomes less of an issue. The point is though, you can accomplish this kind of basic treatment for very little expense and very little effort. You also wanna have the room be reasonably quiet. You don't want too many outside sounds distracting you or interfering with what you're hearing in the monitors. You know, I, I admit it would be really hard to mix in an apartment in a busy downtown city. There would just be so much outside ambient noise. But in a typical house in a neighborhood, I actually found that bit of ambient noise helped me. Now, why? It's because it actually masks some of the unimportant low-level details of the mix. 
So if you're in a super dead quiet environment, especially if you've got really big fancy monitors, you're gonna hear all these little tiny details of your mix. And it's easy to spot problems that in reality are actually tiny, but sound big in that space. And you really overthink it and go down the rabbit hole, focusing on stuff that doesn't really matter. But when you cannot hear those tiny problems, you start focusing on the stuff that does matter. And so I found when I moved from my more well-treated studio to mixing out of a bedroom with this ambient noise, I just couldn't hear a lot of the small moves I was making. And so I had to make bigger moves with EQ or compression or just the volume fader in order to actually hear what I was doing. And the result was great. It made my mixes sound more exciting and energetic and just fun to listen to. So don't stress out about your monitors or your room. It's not so much about what you've got, but how well you know it and being smart with your treatment and the monitors you choose, just to make sure you're not fooling yourself or mixing in an environment that is completely different than what you're used to in the real world. Okay, the next big myth I wanna tackle is that you should do minimal processing in the mix. So like every great myth, there's a grain of truth in it. Of course, the best case scenario is that a track was recorded so well that it barely needs anything in the mix. However, that is not what modern rock and pop sounds like. And that's what I'm talking about in this video. Yes, I know if you're recording an orchestra or a delicate acoustic instrument or something, the same principles might not apply. I get it, okay? But that modern sound is the result of a lot of processing. Anyone who's recorded a live drum kit knows that it doesn't come off the mic sounding like a Metallica record, okay? That's a very processed sound. And sometimes it needs a lot. You know, check out this example here. So here's a set of drum tracks. Okay, listen to the live kick mic. Now look at how much I had to do to this thing. All right, so I'll bypass all the plugins, okay? Gate first. Okay, now we've got the first EQ. And I'm not exactly being gentle here. We're also compressing, but we've got a fair bit of high end boosting and a huge low end cut happening here. Then we got some saturation. And then what's next? More EQ. And again, not very gentle on this one. More saturation. And then I needed to put yet another EQ, making even more cuts, more boosts. Now this is definitely unusual. Usually I need you know one SSL channel, maybe a tiny bit on a second EQ on a kick drum, and that's it. Some kicks, you know, you don't really need that much at all. But this one just needed a lot of work and I kept finding myself in the mix being like, man, am I really gonna put another EQ here? Well, it needs it, so I guess so. And vocals are similar. You know, modern vocal sound is usually the result of a lot of compression and often a lot of EQ too. Now I'm not here arguing for over processing and doing a whole bunch of stuff just because, all right? You only need to process as much as you need to process. But don't let that scare you into stopping short of what is actually needed just because you're worried about doing too much. The goal is not minimal processing and the goal is not maximum processing. The goal is an exciting mix. By the way, I created a mixing cheat sheet that has all of my go-to starting points for EQ and compression for all the different tracks in your mix. I get a lot of messages from people saying that they started using this cheat sheet and it helped their mixes improve literally like that. So it's totally free. You can get it at mixcheatsheet.com or there's a link in the description below. Another big myth out there is that frequencies shouldn't overlap in your mix, especially in the low end. You see a lot of advice out there about carving out separate spaces. So a lot of people will start their mix and they'll make a decision, not with their ears, but just with an idea in their mind that, okay, my kick is gonna live below 60 Hertz and then my bass, I'm gonna filter that part out and, and I'm gonna have that live further up around 80 Hertz. But you don't really need to do that. I mean, I, I never think like that. I mean, often I boost 60 Hertz on a kick drum and then I'll boost 60 Hertz on a bass guitar as well. I like how it sounds on both and I want them to overlap and interact. Don't think of your job as being a separator you're a mixer, you want things to blend and overlap. That's where the glue and energy comes from. And if everything is too carved out and separate, 
then your mix is gonna sound really lifeless, dull, and flat, and boring. Even as I say this, I'm aware that these myths are tricky because I'm not trying to just give you a rule that's the opposite, right? I'm just saying don't come to the mix making a decision in advance based on something you heard that you're gonna carve stuff up in a certain way. Just use your ears. And lots of times you will have to carve out some low end and high end in order to make space in your mix. But lots of other times you won't and your mix will actually benefit from leaving more of that overlap in there. The point is don't be a separator, be a mixer. This next one is a biggie. It's the myth that every song requires a different approach. Reality is the pros do not work like that. They approach every song the same way. The grain of truth here is that, of course, every song requires different decisions. You know, let's say song A, you're working on one day, you need to add 8 dB of top end to that vocal, and you need to have a whole bunch of slamming parallel compression mixed in with the drums. And then the next day, the next song, you only need to add 3 dB of top end to that vocal, and you need to mix that parallel compression way down because it just sounds silly to have the drums hit that hard. Now, of course that is the case, but you should be making those decisions within a framework. So for me, whether I'm mixing a metalcore song or an acoustic pop rock song, I'm using the same mix template, the same plugin chains, the same effect sense, and the same overall order to which I'm doing things. It's the same workflow. It's only the decisions within that framework that change. But if you get this myth twisted up the wrong way, you're gonna be changing the framework constantly. For example, if your mixing chains are different every day, if, if every time you need to pull up an EQ or a compressor, you start scrolling through your list and wondering which one of your 15 EQs you need to use this time, that's when you're really handicapping yourself. Think about Chris Lord Algae. He's not deciding whether he should mix on an SSL or a Neve depending on the song. He's mixing on the same console for decades. That's the framework he's working in. He's just making different decisions within that framework in order to nail each song. Speaking of consoles though, the next myth I need to bust is that analog gear sounds better. Now, one of the benefits of running this channel is that I've been able to do some recent videos where I'm shooting out tape versus digital and vintage analog gear versus the plug-in versions. And guys, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. The plug-in emulations sound so close, it's almost identical. And even if there is a difference, it doesn't matter. Whether you've got an analog console or a DAW full of plugins, it all comes down to the same thing. You listen to a sound, you decide what needs to change, and you make that adjustment. The end product has been digital for 40 years. Digital mixing has been the norm for, I guess, about 20. There really is no more debate about quality. So don't let a video or some post on a forum drag you down and make you think that an analog summing mixer or a hardware compressor is finally gonna give you that sound. All right, that's like being a terrible artist and believing that a new pencil is gonna make a difference. Final myth I'm gonna bust here is that the magic is in the mix. No, the magic is in the song, the performance, and the production. The mix just enhances what's there. Ironically, for every one video you see about songwriting, you'll see 10 videos about how to EQ. And I guess I'm kind of guilty of the same thing making this video, but there's this obsession with the mix phase. You know, a lot of people spend the least amount of time possible working on the song and the arrangement and the production and getting the best possible performance. And then they go and spend days, weeks, even months trying to mix the thing into something good. It's exactly backwards. If you're serving food at a restaurant with crappy ingredients, poorly cooked, well, it doesn't matter how cool you make it look on the plate, it's still gonna taste bad. The best way to put it is this, a great mix is never gonna save a crappy song, but a great song can make up for a mediocre mix. The magic doesn't happen at mix time. It happens in the lyrics, the chords, the production, the performances, and how they're captured. The mixing is just like the Hollywood special effects. It's the spice, the flavor, the final presentation. So if you wanna go deeper into some of the things I talked about here, check out this video next. It talks about why the mid-range is the most important part of your mix and how you can make sure you nail it.